This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. For thousands of years, people and animals have lived together, sharing love and loyalty, food and fire. Every day, our animals continue to remind us to do what we can to maintain the delicate balance of nature. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, in a special episode of Rescue 911, we celebrate the special bond humans and animals share with true stories of extraordinary actions and the extremes to which we'll go to protect each other. We begin just after midnight on March 8, 1993, in Modesto, California. A woman had phoned stating that she was having a peace disturbance with her son, and that he was possibly high on drugs, and that he was acting violent. Modesto police officer Rick Pop was the first on the scene. Great! What do you want? I discovered that he was in an agitated state, was screaming at me to leave. And at that time, I saw an elderly woman waving her arms, saying, come in, come in, in a very nervous, frightened voice. Let him in! Can I talk to you out here? He said, I'm not talking to you anymore. Yeah, Attempted to close the door. So and at that time, I took it upon myself to confront him. Get out! At first, I couldn't tell what he had in his hand. So get out of here! Then I realized that he had a knife. Drop the knife, Rich. Drop the knife, Rich. He said, get Drop out of my knife. house, get out of my house. Drop it! And then he bolted and ran. Backup officer Jim Sanders joined the pursuit. I could see Officer Pop chasing the suspect down the roadway of the mobile home park. I radioed dispatch that we need additional officers, then began to chase the suspect in the patrol unit. He held a knife out in front of him, threatening me, Drop the knife, and then he Rich. bolted back to where he'd run from. As we were chasing him, I was becoming more concerned with the safety of anybody that he'd run across. Drop it, now! Drop it! I got out of the patrol unit with my weapon drawn, yelling for him to stop, and also dropped a knife. At that point, I felt if he did not comply with our orders, that I was going to have to use daily force against this person. When we continue, I was thinking, all right, he's throwing the knife down, let's end it, you know, send Duke. As Duke was running toward him, he turned, and he still had the knife. When Modesto police officers arrived at the scene of a domestic disturbance, the suspect threatened them with a knife before fleeing on foot. Additional backup units en route included canine officer Gene Ballantyne, and his partner of four and a half years, Duke. All I knew was a guy was running, there was a knife involved, and I could hear a chase going on. I could just tell this was not going to be a good situation that we were going into. I was just very nervous. Whenever I get anxious and my adrenaline starts flowing, Duke feels that way also. We're together 24 hours a day, and 
because of that, you get this very close bond. He's my best friend, my partner, my confidant. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Duke things that I would never tell anyone else. I heard over the radio that the suspect with a knife had gone back into his mobile home and that we might have a hostage situation. He has a knife in his hand. He's still inside the trailer. I don't know where he's at right now. out of control. John! I was thinking, should I send Duke? Should I do it now? And I just knew the guy's got this knife. Let's hold off. Let's just wait. I didn't think he had the knife anymore. So I was thinking, all right, he's throwing the knife down. Let's end it. You know, send Duke. As Duke was running toward him, he turned and he still had the knife. It was like my heart dropped. I thought, oh, God. I called Duke off. And he stopped and turned around and laid down, which is what he was trained to do. I thought, we don't have a choice now because we've got his only exit block. It was a split-second decision on, do you use deadly force, do you shoot him, or do you send the dog? charged him and then physically restrained him, knocking the knife from his grip. I could hear Duke kind of whimpering. He had gotten to the bottom of the stairs and he was just kind of laying on the sidewalk. Duke! Oh, buddy, you okay? I went to grab Duke and then my hand slid around the left side and I came up with just this handful of blood. Okay, it'll be okay, buddy. And he kind of licked me in the face. It was like, God, he's telling me goodbye. I was thinking, man, I don't think we're going to make it. K-9 officer Ron Cloward had also responded to the call. Ron, the dog's dead! It was heart-wrenching, knowing that the dog had been stabbed, not knowing how serious it was. It could have been my dog. It could have been me in that situation. Easy. We know that our dogs are there to take the ultimate sacrifice so that an officer doesn't have to, but when it happens, it hurts deep down inside. Some help out here, please! We got the first aid kit out of the trunk of his car and started wrapping bandages around the area of where the wounds were at. Oh, my good boy, I'm so proud of you. At that point, I was just thinking this was probably the end. He was just laying there with his eyes open. Damn, it was so sad. I picked him up. I said, no, we're not waiting for anybody. Let's go. Let's go now. Duke was rushed to Modesto's veterinary emergency clinic in critical condition. I was just, uh, do something, do something fast. They were trying to figure out how many times he'd been stabbed, where he'd been stabbed. We just knew that he was bleeding a lot and he wasn't making any moves at all. Pretty decent wound. Two deep stab wounds had punctured Duke's chest, cutting through lung tissue and major blood vessels. It was like he didn't even see me there. And that was the first time I ever, ever experienced him not even realizing I was there. You can see how bad he's bleeding. It may not have changed yet, but let's take a look at it. Although Duke was stabilized, after two days, his condition had deteriorated so much, he was transferred to UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital and put under the care of Dr. Janet Aldridge. He developed difficulty with breathing and he was becoming very anemic. In my opinion, he was very likely to die within the next 12 hours. Although Duke was on medication and in an oxygen cage, his condition was not improving. He was alert and not resting until Jean was in the room. I could see by monitoring devices that when Gene was with him, the dog was more relaxed. His blood pressure dropped and that he went to sleep. Better and better, Gene. That's amazing. So we invited Gene to be hospitalized with him. For the next seven days, Gene never left Duke and even slept in his cage with him. We relied on each other through our whole career. He relies on me for his safety. I rely on him for my safety. and. 
here he had just done this for me, and it was real important for me to try and do something to help him. And this says, to Duke, get well soon. You're a hero. We love you. The community support was amazing. I hope Every day, another box would come, and it would be just full of mail for Duke. There were get well cards from people that had drawn pictures and said, you know, get well, Duke, we love you, come back home. And I read every single one to him. It kept me going, and I think that kept Duke going, too. Two weeks after the stabbing, Gene got his 30th birthday wish. Duke was finally well enough to go home. All the nurses and doctors from the hospital were there. And we just had a, a huge party. They gave Duke a little diploma for being an outstanding patient in ICU. It was neat. It was a real neat thing. Again, that's Corporal Ballantyne and the Modesto Police Department and that dog, Duke. Duke is retired now, I hear, and enjoying a life of leisure at home, but his boss still has to work. Duke's become kind of a local hero. He hates retired life, plays around the house now and does nothing but just get fat and think about poodles, but uh, right now he's doing excellent. Thank you very much. The suspect who stabbed Duke was subsequently found guilty of multiple felony charges and sentenced to 11 years in jail. Just to see a happy Duke again and to see everybody giving him all of this attention and all the support. I'm like a proud papa. And that's my boy, he done fine. He did a good, good job. He saved a life that night and I think he deserves all the attention that he can get. Corporal Valentine, thank you very much. Thank you, Duke. Yeah. We want that to go in his trophy case. We heard he's got a bunch of trophies. I'm telling myself, you can't just not use your head and run down there into a burning home just to save an animal, but my mind was telling me one thing and my heart was telling me the other. Jean Cherry of the Dalles, Oregon, is something most people are not. She's a pig lover. From the moment Jean met Wilmer, the pot-bellied pig, the porcine pet stole Jean's heart. But for Jean's husband, Jack, the idea of having a pig around the house took some getting used to. The first time it bit me, I whacked it on the head, and it ran off squealing and whining, and I was like, I'm going to really play this up. Limped around with one leg up, comes crying to Gene. <laughs> I'm going, you big, you big tattletale, you know. <laughs> my family and most of my friends I think I'm very strange because I'm so devoted to this pig. But I just love her. And with my daughter going off to college, I just I had to have something to mother, you know? It was just like an empty nest type thing. Lisa Renard and her husband live directly across the street from the cherries. Morning, Jean! Hi, Lisa! How are you? I didn't know my neighbor Jean all that well, but I could tell that they were really close, that that pig really meant something to her. Look! Look at that silly pig! The first time I saw Wilma, she's like the size of a baseball with legs. Come on. Around 7.30 on the morning of October 14th, 1993, Jack Cherry had already left for work, and Jean was on her way out the door. Oh, it's a good girl. Before I left, I went in, and I blocked her off into the kitchen, and there was a big window there so she could look out. And I noticed that I could see steam coming off of my neighbor's house, but I just thought it was because of the rain.
when I looked out my dining room window, I saw the flames shooting up through the tree. 911 emergency. Uh, my neighbor's house is on fire. It's coming up out of the roof right now. Okay, flames or just smoke? It's flames. I can see them. Okay, all right. The other dispatcher is going to get the uh, ambulance or the fire crews going. What's your name? I'm Lisa Renard, Jeff Renard's wife. All right, Lisa. Okay, calm down just a minute. Do you think there's anyone in the they're house? They're not home. They're both at work, but they do have a pot belly pig in the house. They're not home, no. but there's a pot belly pig inside. Yes. Yeah. Nyla Hill had been a communications operator for two years. I love animals. It's bad enough to lose your home to a fire and all your valuables, but when you lose your pets, it's horrible. I'm going to run over there and see if all oh, I can't get in the house. That's not cool. I won't do that. Okay, all right. I'm see if one of the doors is open, but I don't want to go near the Okay, fire. Lisa, don't, don't get, I mean, if, if you can see flames out of the roof already. Okay. And there's cars driving by, so you're going to get more calls. Okay, it's not going to be safe for you to go in the no, house. I know that. We'll let the yeah. fire crew know that there's a pot-bellied pig in the house. Okay. okay. All right, thanks for the call, Bye. Lisa. Bye-bye. The Dallas police officer, Jeff Mason, was on patrol less than a mile from the house. I heard a structure fire being dispatched, and there was a pot that pig trapped inside. I didn't know what the fire was like, but I felt that if I could get there in time, that maybe we could get the pig out. Oh my God, save it! I'm telling myself that it's not good. You can't just not use your head and run down there into a burning home just to save an animal. But my mind was telling me one thing, and my heart was telling me the other. From the heavy smoke and the flames that I could see coming out, I thought the pig would already be dead. The pig's in the house! The pig in the house? Yes, Officer Mason said, well, we need to just wait here a minute until the fire department comes. And then we heard Wilma the pig scream. Everybody stay here. It was almost human. Hearing the pig squealing in there in distress. I couldn't have stood by and just, you know, let the pig die. The door and the doorknob was cool, and that told me that there were no flames right on the other side of the door. Oh my gosh, poor Wilma. You could see the pig laying in on the floor. I couldn't tell if it was breathing, but it was quivering. It felt lifeless. It felt like it's too late. The pig had already died. She was breathing, but it was very faint. So I just cupped my hands around her snout and was taking deep breaths and blowing them into her snout. She didn't make any noises in my arms. She just kind of laid there. Jean got a call at work telling her about the fire. My first thought was, I don't care that there's a fire in that house. Wilma's in that house. I mean, it's a terrible feeling. Units with the Dallas Fire Department began arriving within eight minutes of the call. Did we get some oxygen for this pig? Yes, right there in the first compartment. I went into the ambulance, got the oxygen tank, and put it on the pig. And after about three minutes, the pig was starting to come around. I pulled up and I mean I just bailed out of the car and of course the firemen were yelling at me and that's when Lisa yelled at me and said you know I have Wilma over here and then it didn't matter you know they're only it was only things and things can be replaced there weren't any humans in the house but Wilma's almost human to the cherry she was more than just an animal she'd become a part of the family Thank you. I walked around with her for a while and talked to her, and I could see that she was starting to come out of it a little bit. I just love her. You know, she's, she's my buddy. Assistant Fire Chief Charlie Norris and his crew had the fire out within 10 minutes. Officer Mason had some firefighter training, but I don't think it's wise to put yourself in jeopardy. I mean, the cold, hard truth is fire kills. An investigation subsequently revealed that the fire that burned the Cherry's house was caused by a damaged electrical cord. The big thing is being careful with your electricity. Boy, I tell you, we always thought we were pretty common sense about that, but as we learn, you know, it can really bite you. Ricky Harrell, go on. I think the heroes in this story are Lisa and Officer Mason. I mean, he didn't have to risk his life to go in and pull out a pig.
The word quickly spread throughout the fire department and the police department and quotes of, you saved the bacon and pig saves the pig and somebody's made up a rubber stamp that everything that goes into my mailbox at work, um, somebody stamps it with this pig. And she, she figured out how to get that. He risked his life for us. He did a real nice thing and I sent him a card that had uh, little pigs on the front and it said, uh, I'm so glad you're part of my family and signed at Wilma. I'm sure he got roused for that, but I just wanted him to know that we really appreciated what he did. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Next. I wanted to do as much as I could for her. Lay down. She's my friend. She's my buddy. Um, I would just be lost without her. In the wild, it might be survival of the fittest, but for those animals who share our homes with us, there's almost nothing we wouldn't do to try and save their lives. This story is not a recreation. It's a look inside one of the world's leading animal care facilities, the University of California at Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital, where they never know from day to day what might walk, trot, or slither through their doors. Walk her up and then make a nice gradual turn so we can see what her gait looks like. A lot of people would think that the best part about being a veterinarian is helping animals, but I would have to say that probably equally as rewarding is helping people and not underestimating the role that an animal plays in someone's life. To see the owner's happy face is very fulfilling. We're trying to locate where the air leak is in the chest. On July 30th, 1993, an eight-year-old poodle is prepared for lung surgery that will be performed by Dr. Claire Gregory. Sophie was diagnosed at her own veterinarian as having a breathing difficulty, and when they took radiographs of the chest, they found that the chest was uh, full of air. She had complete collapse of both lungs, and so for her to survive for a long period of time would have been questionable. So the plan today is to open her chest down the middle, look at both sets of lungs, cover them with saline, with fluid, and just like checking a bicycle tire, for a leak, we're going to put the lungs under water and look for the bubble. Sophie's owner is Lura Dulles. Dr. Gregory told me that this was a risky surgery. It, it was very hard to think that I might never see her again. One, two, three. Surgically, we better find the leak in the lung and either repair it or remove that portion of the lung that was leaking. Stand by with the fluid. Okay, we're ready. Now, the leak appears to be in the accessory lobe on the right side. Yeah, we just have to find it. <laughs> yeah, let's touch it down a bit. There it is, right there. See the ball? Uh huh. That's it. Right there. There it is, right there, but the bubbles coming up. See the bubbles? Uh, the surgery went well. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, we did. When he told me that she'd be okay, and um, that I'd, you know, I'd have a few more years with her. You know, I really don't ever think I've been quite so happy and so relieved in my life. It appeared just to be one lesion, and uh, we were able to remove it. Uh -huh. There was no sign of cancer, infection, or anything like that. Oh, this is such wonderful news. Thank you. You bet. So I'll come in and see her this evening, then? That's fine. There she is. Oh, my baby. I'm so honored. Oh, so Oh, hi, baby. I'm amazed. I mean, I just sort of expected to see sort of a little puddle here. <laughs> I knew I was attached to her, you know. But I had no idea how attached <laughs> Ever since Sophie was a little tiny puppy, when she would get nervous or whatever, I would sing this the Sophie song to her. Well, not even the doctors here. <laughs> Sophie, Sophie, Sophie. <laughs> if I were under anesthesia and uh, a little confused, um, a song that somebody sang to me might, might mean something to me, so I think she heard me. <laughs> if she has no complications over the weekend, she'll be able to go home on Monday. 
Oh, thank you. Debbie, a one-year-old filly, is brought in by her owner, Mary Armstrong, and put under the care of Dr. Sally Vibrette. About two months ago, she developed severe colic. We diagnosed that her colon was twisted. We took her to surgery, and there was about a three-and-a-half-foot um, section that had twisted and was dead that needed to be taken out. Postoperatively, Debbie did great. But last Friday, Debbie became colicky again. She, she lays down and rolls to show signs of abdominal pain right now. She wasn't getting any better. So um, the prognosis was not good, and they, that's when they started to advise me that maybe I ought to start thinking of what I want to do if she is not going to pull through this. Usually horses, when they're painful, will try to get away from themselves and they throw themselves on the ground and do a lot of damages to themselves. So we have to keep her distracted so that she doesn't decide to lay down. Go ahead and give her a She's already paid several thousand dollars to have the original surgery. She really can't afford to have us do any more surgery on the horse, so we offered today um, an option of doing laparoscopy, and so later on today we're going to go... I wanted to do as much as I could for her. She's my friend, she's my buddy. Um, I would just be lost without her. We suspect adhesions, but we'll have to be very careful. For laparoscopy, we put a sterile viewing scope into their intestine. A second colic surgery was not really an option for Debbie. And I wanted to make sure that she didn't have a piece of bowel that was starting to die. In that case, it would not have been appropriate to have her continue with her ordeal. That small colon looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks a little bit distended, yeah, not greatly distended. But did you feel that though? It felt a little salt. I don't know. If, I mean, I've you know I've poked around in in a few abdomens, and I don't you know recall poking into something like that. So, and it could be a feed impaction too. That. Have you had a good look at the small colon yet? It doesn't look bad. Good. So she may have some adhesions to her small intestine, and then causing some partial obstruction. We didn't see any bowel in there that was dying, that had lost its blood supply or that was twisted. But at the same time, we still didn't have a firm diagnosis about what Debbie's problem was. We could be looking at something that might be a chronic problem. It's hard to predict. She said, it's okay to say I can't afford anymore. Um, it's okay to say she's suffered enough. I can't let her go on anymore. I just want to make sure that we've given adequate time for something that might pass to pass. She had this feeling that she was going to get through and we just needed to give her one more day. I agreed. I wanted to give her one more day. I would give her one more day, probably for eternity. And I always wonder about that one more day, perhaps. Yeah. One more day to go on forever. I guess that's what I'm concerned a little bit about, too. Um, let's give her one more day. Okay. When she was born, I was so happy with her. She was healthy, she was big, she was beautiful, and uh, I fell in love with her immediately. Whenever she sees you, she always greets you with a whinny and a nicker. She just loves to be with you. I thought it was important that we give Debbie lots of time, but at some point, I think it's important to realize that you've tried and that we might not win the battle. No matter what happens to Debbie, she'll always be a very special friend, a very special time in my life that I'll never forget. Um, I'll always love her. Come on, Sophie. Two days have passed since Sophie's surgery. <laughs> when we brought her back into Dr. Gregory, she seemed to feel like she had friends there. Oh. <laughs> Let's put her up on the table. A lot of thoracic disease that we see is chronic, long-term, that has a lot of complications, a lot of therapy required. Nice thing for Sophie was that she had a bad disease, but it was easily corrected. It's moving lots of air. Good girl. <laughs> Seeing Sophie today, she was wagging her tail and, and trotting alongside her mom, that's perfect. <laughs> that's 
what it's all about. She practically dragged me out to the car. I, I think she knew she had a hamburger coming on the way home. <laughs> The day after the laparoscopy, Dr. Vivret checks up on Debbie. So, so far she's doing good. How are her gut sounds doing? Um, she has some gut sounds, so good. With lots of fluids, lubricants, and analgesics, she seems to be coming out of it. She's bright. She's alert. We're giving her handfuls of feed. She's eating it um, with great delight. She doesn't seem painful at all. Two piles of manure in her stall since four in the morning is a really good sign. And she has passed some oil through. So she is? Good. That's great. So. You can go ahead and keep walking around. Thanks. Hi. I continue to have good news. Okay. Okay. Oh. She seems to be doing very well. <laughs> I'm tickled. I'm, I'm glad. Wonderful. And my feeling is that she probably will make it. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, my yes. Flight. I was elated. It was, it was wonderful. It was the best news that she could have given me. Um, I immediately wanted to go up and see her, to hug her, and give her a kiss. <laughs> Hi, Hi, your mom. Hi, your mom. She came to see you. She looked at me like it's all your fault. You put me here and I'm going to be angry with you. It kind of tugs at your heart, too. It's like, well, I'm sorry, but I'm just bringing you up here to get better, you know, and you can't explain that to animals. You want to take her outside? She likes to go out and eat some grass. We're going to have to be careful for the next few days, bring her back onto feed slowly. We uh, took her for a little walk around the green grass, and get a chance to get some exercise and uh, we just had our little heart-to-heart -heart conversation again um I was just very happy to be with her you're a big softy six months later debbie has completely recovered from her bout with colic we've just started training she's coming along very well <laughs> she's uh, got a good attitude she likes people you always turn around Fussy, but that's what we expect for a two-year-old. What do you like best about her? She's alive. <laughs> alive. Yeah. I think Sally, not only is she a wonderful doctor, but she's a person from the heart. My life would have a big hole in it if I didn't have Debbie. She's really wrapped herself around my heart. And I always love her. Sophie is not expected to have a recurrence of the lesion that was removed from her lung. Everyone that we met at the hospital, it was completely obvious that they cared tremendously about the animals. Go slow, Sophie. Come on. They weren't at all surprised by how attached I am to Sophie. This seemed to be their everyday experience was with dealing with people who love their animals as desperately as we love Sophie. Such an excellent little beast. She's, She's a wonderful little spirit on this planet. She certainly makes all my days brighter, but I think she makes everybody's day brighter. I think we're all better off to have Sophie here. We do love you. We're very glad to have you home. Very glad to have you home. If anybody out there is listening that you think you can help with this little trap puppy, maybe there's somebody out there that knows what to do. Tom Fowler of Corpus Christi, Texas is a decorated veteran. And perhaps because he fought in Vietnam, he values life to a degree that others might not. On July 27, 1993, Tom was at the print shop he owns when an unusual problem tested his determination, leaving no doubt that heroes are truly a breed apart. I am a dog lover, and these strays running loose makes me feel 
pretty bad. People should know that animals cannot fend for themselves, that they get in trouble when they're left alone. This particular day, I had been watching a mother and three puppies. About 45 minutes later, she was looking towards a sewer opening, and she only had two of the puppies. These are wild dogs, so the minute you start to walk towards them, will they run from you? Here, puppy, puppy. I could not see the puppy, but I could hear it. It had apparently crawled up into a 10-inch line that runs up underneath the street. I felt very badly for it. But I knew that I would not give up until that puppy was out of that sewer line. You just set the food and water down there. By the second day, Tom's seven-year-old daughter, Aspasia, had joined the rescue effort. Down you go. Be careful. Every day we would put some food for the puppy down in the sewer. Okay, in the water. It was kind of frustrating because I wanted him to come out right then and you just pick him up. Puppy, 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 puppy. But I think he was kind of scared of humans. Can you hear him? No. Come on, let me get you out. I was afraid that the puppy might die because I knew that there were all sorts of things down there that could bite him. I wonder if the puppy ate. Well, we'll see when we get the cover off. As long as he was coming out to eat and water, we knew we could keep him alive. But the puppy ate it all. But once it rained, then that was it. The puppy was gone. We decided to put a trap in there and see if we could catch the puppy. But he would not go into it. He ate the food around the trap, but he didn't eat the food in the trap. For six days, we had tried everything we could think of. I never wanted to give up because I wanted to save that puppy. We're going to have to think of something else. This is 1440 Keys Radio. The show's called Breakfast with Bernie. You're tuned in to the mouth of South Texas, the conscience of Corpus Christi. Let's go to one of our callers, Tom. Good morning. Good morning, Bernie. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, I know this is probably not a major item of interest around, but I've got a, a trap puppy down here. What? Yeah. Hey, don't, are you serious? No, about eight weeks old. Oh. Bernie Seal hosts a popular talk radio show in Corpus Christi. It was kind of a slow day. I was tired of listening to people complain about Clinton, talk about taxes, talk about their mother-in-law, and then all of a sudden this call comes in about the puppy, and boy, oh boy. He fell in. Fell in what, a sewer? Yeah, one of these storm sewers. Oh, God. So we've been working a week to get him out, and we can't. We've called the Humane Society, we've called Animal Control, we've oh, called that's terrible. Modern Gas Division. It tore at my heartstrings. It made me feel like this was a challenge. we got to get him out. Yeah, i got to get him out because he's okay. I mean, you know, he's going to stay alive till it rains. In the morning is pretty heavily trafficked time here in Corpus Christi, so I figured this is our chance. If anybody out there is listening that you think you can help Tom with this lost, this little trap puppy that's down in one of the sewers, and you are keeping him alive by throwing food down there, yeah, if it rains, he's a goner. That's right. Let's see what kind of heart this community has. Maybe there's somebody out there that knows what to do. Come on, Alec, let's go. Twelve miles away, dog breeder and trainer Chris Risk happened to be listening to Bernie's program that day. When I heard that this little puppy was trapped under there, I felt real terrible, and I knew how scared it must be to be under there all by itself. I have a 10-year-old Catahoula dog named Annie Fanny. I said, Annie, let's go. There's a puppy in trouble. So she came with me. He's really worried about it, because if it rains, that puppy's going down the sewer. How can we save that dog? Well, it can fix you a net like you do a parachute. Yeah. The switchboard is lighting up like a Christmas tree, and we were fielding suggestions. It'll spread out. It spreads out. When he goes in to get the food, boom, they pull him up. He'll get tangled in it and get him out of That's a great idea, B.B. I hope they listen. that, but, you know, that's just one way. Let's go to Charlie. Good morning, Charlie. Hello. How are we going to save the dog? Well, I was thinking about your pole. Get a pole. Well, remember how you used to catch chickens? No, how? That loop on the end of this pole. Yeah. You get to the puppy? Yeah. Get around it. 
and then pull the snare. Right. Different people were calling in about traps and snares and things that I knew from being around dogs would not work. And I was getting pretty worried. Somebody's got to save that dog. Bernie went completely off the board on it, like he normally does, and a crowd started showing up. Hey, Waylon, what's happening? Listen, I just want to tell you that whoever gets the dog out, after they get the dog out and take a shower, yeah. if they come to Fat Days, they get a free hamburger. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. Okay, Waylon. A man whose generosity that knows no bounds. We got to save that. This is really exciting, y'all. <laughs> When we first got there, everybody was standing around. Glad to meet you. Glad to meet you. The puppy's still there? I told them, my dog Annie Fanny will retrieve just about anything I send her for. And they all looked kind of skeptical. You think Annie can get him out? Well, she'll sure try. However, it was worth a shot. We'll be real careful lower her down. There you go. Good girl. Good girl, Annie. Okay, Annie. All right. Get the baby. Go get the baby, Annie. Good girl. Go. Go get that baby. Go. Good girl. Get. Go on. Get it. I can't hear her. She's all the way in there. Do you see the puppy over there? We popped the sewer covers across the street. Get over here. Okay, look for him. He may be coming through. I am still a skeptic. I did not believe that dog would bring that puppy out. Well, I hope she does get him. I still don't hear her. No. I can't see her. I can't but hear her. She's gone. Oh, there's her tail. Look, look. Look, here she comes. Look. Oh, here she Here comes. There's her tail. Oh, look. Here look. she's here backing she up. Here she comes. She she's coming. She's got the she's puppy got in the her mouth. Hold it. Hold it. I really couldn't believe it. She had that puppy in her mouth. Everybody thought it was wonderful. Everybody was applauding. I couldn't believe how cute it was. She got Danny Fanny up, and she was grinning and wagging her tail, like, as if she knew she had done something really good. And I was very proud of her. Yeah, he's a pretty one. Being a, a dog handler and a dog breeder, I've seen many, many uh, feats and acts from dogs, but I was not aware that there was a dog that would do something like that. Good girl, Annie, good girl. She's the real hero. Good girl. Can you believe it? The puppy is out. He's doing great. Boy, Tom had been working a week to get the dog out to sewer, and we had finally done it. Good morning, Tom. What happened? Uh, we've had all kind of people here. Now we got a puppy, a uh, male. Yeah. We need a home. Oh, gosh. That, oh, what, the, what are we going to call it? I don't know. Well, Paul wants to name the dog Stinky. That might be cute. Yeah, whatever. The important point is that we got immediate response after you announced. Oh, that is right so, goal. I am so proud. What I was thrilled to death that I could do something to help because that makes me believe that we're doing a service to the people that we're talking to out there. Can you see them? Animal control officers search the neighborhood for the rest of the puppies. Oh, I hear a pair underneath here. You can hear them. Unwanted animals in America are a real problem today because people will not spay and neuter their pets. Over 20,000 were killed last year in Dallas alone at one shelter. If you're going to have an animal, take care of it. Because a life is a life, whether it's an animal or a human or a bird or what. A life is a life. Oh, he got it! After being treated for a rat bite, the eight-week-old puppy was adopted by Becky Murrow, who works for Bernie, and her two young sons. This place, come on. Let go. We're looking for a puppy for quite a while, and this one just happened to fall in our lap. So, my God said, here's your puppy. This one's for you. Put him inside. Come on. I can't imagine our life without him now. He brings a lot of happiness in our home. Whenever I lay down on the grass, he comes and licks my face. He's a very special dog to me and my family. He's very special. Oh, here he comes. Look, oh, Becky. Oh, Marcus and Daniel. The most unique thing about this entire story 
is that Annie Fanny went into a teenage drain pipe, picks the puppy up in her mouth, and brings her out on command. Hey, look, boys. Look, look. Look who's here. She should be the hero dog of the year in America. Hell, Phil. Come on. Hell, Phil. 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 Hell,